Americans have the right to usurp whatever's written and proud to say sola scriptura, but they can't even read about their own Sabbath day. He goes on and on. Well, I could, I could validate and qualify all these things, but I'm just trying to establish a stage. The stage is, what's the truth? What's the truth? The first word of the Ten Commandments in Hebrew is anoki. The writer on this. Anoki, written in Paleo Hebrew, is the uh, Aleph, Moon, Kaf. Actually, there's two ways to write a letter, letter Kaf. Is, it, it, the letter Kaf is an open hand. So you might write it like that, and then Yod, Anoki. It, it's translated as I am. The Yod is a suffix, means my. And the Aleph is a prefix, means I am or I will. But Anok, if you look up in the dictionary, is a plumb line. So you can tell what this means by plumb line. And Aleph Nun has to do with uh, moving towards something. And Kaf, as a suffix, the word means you. So if you look at this part of the word, and you can look at that part of the word, you can look at the two-letter segments, the one-letter segments. That's, we can get into that a little bit. But the point is, it means Yahweh reaching his hand down. So when he, a, a plumb line, continue with construction, if you hold a, a level up, you know, it's hard to read sometimes the level, and even a digital one can be off. But a plumb line, you hold that up and it finds true center, right now to the center of the earth. It's, it's perfectly plumb. For Yahweh, it says, Anoki. It's translated in English to simply, I. Anoki Yahweh El Hecha. I am Yahweh your Elohim. You can say, well, okay. He's just identifying himself with us and move on. But if you look at this a little closer, he says, I am handing down to you my hand to your hand. Your hand, cop is a suffix, means your, it's the open hand. The yod is a working hand, like a grabbing hold of something. You can kind of see that shape in there, grabbing a tool. He says, I, my hand is reaching down to give you the plumb line, the standard by which all other things can be measured for true verticality. Now the interesting thing about the word for truth, there's a couple words for truth. Emmet is one, which is Aleph, Mem, Tav, like the, like the person's name, Emmet. The Aleph is a, is a one silent letter. It, sometimes you could just call it an A sound or an E, an e sound by default. But the thing about Aleph, Mem, Tav is that Aleph is the first letter, Tav is the last letter, and the Mem is not exactly the center letter, lever, but being in, near the middle of the alphabet, it lines up with our letter M, and the letter Mem is basically like a womb. It's water. It's a place where in an environment that something that is about, about to be birthed is in. And it also means something hidden that will then be exposed. And it's shaped like a wave. And so picture a tsunami. Say there's an earthquake over here. Now there's the shock wave underneath that you don't see necessarily. But it's moving and it's there and it's building. And all of a sudden, whoo, there's the, the tsunami hits the shore. But the, but the event was the whole time from the initiator, that, that shock wave, until... This, this thing happens over here. So it, we'll get into this in a few minutes in the alphabetic progression. But when you have Mem and Noon as a, as a uh, like the English alphabetic sequence, this is M and N. Noon is known as a fish or that which jumps out of the water. Well, it lines up with the f uh, third festival of Shavuot, which is a 50-day festival. Now, a lot of people render this as two festivals. I disagree based on this pattern which we can talk about. But the point about that is there's 49 days of counting, and then the 50th day is where it jumps out. And the pattern of that is that if you count these letters as uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and then 20, 30, 40, 50, the number 50 happens to be new. Is that a coincidence? Maybe. But if, if the mem is the 49 days of counting, and then the 50th for Pentecost, the Greek penta is 5 or 50 in cost, like what does it cost? you're counting out silver to buy something. So Pentecost literally means count 50. And Shavuot, the word Shavuot literally is the word for weeks because Shavah is seven. So you count 49 and then verse on the 50. So I would maintain according to the pattern that this is one festival, it's one 50 day festival. Some people render this as the, the first day of wave, the wave offering the, is the one festival and then 50 days later is another festival. Well, when you're pregnant, you can say, well, the celebration is the day you give birth, but the whole event is conception of birth, which is the whole picture, and that's the picture that's embedded here. So, by having one letter 
you're invoking that this is the environment where this is going to happen, and this is pulled into here. So then you say, well, what's the significance of Aleph and Tav, the first letter in the last? And you jump to the book of Revelation, and the one that showed himself to John said, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Would he be speaking Greek? Oh, yes, of course. Greek was the authorized tongue. Only it's been said by people who've done research that the people who spoke Hebrew as the Kadosh tongue were so offended by the Greeks having taken over the culture and taken over the land and taken over the language that they would rather have pork in their mouth than having a Greek word in their mouth. And if that's the case, from the people who regard the Torah, I don't think that Yeshua would come back when he's speaking to his Hebrew friend and said, speak his words, Alpha and Omega. He'd probably be speaking Hebrew. Now that can't be proven, but it's a matter of deductive reasoning. If he was speaking Hebrew, he would have said, I'm the Aleph and the Tav, which is the first letter and the last letter. Now, I don't know how much everybody knows regarding Hebrew or regarding the Torah or the words written in the so I may say things that you go, yeah, 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 I already know that. Is, is there anybody here, anybody here that doesn't know the Hebrew alphabet? Okay, okay so um, is, is there anybody here who doesn't know much about the Hebrew scriptures in terms of a few? Okay, so I, if everybody knew, then I would, I would go on to some other thing. But if you don't know, then I'll go back and I'll cover some of the basics. Okay? So the significance of Aleph and Tav. There's one word in Hebrew which is never translated into any other language and happens to be spelled Al-Tav. Just as kind of a shorthand, sometimes what I'll do is, this is the paleo, what I'll write is Aleph and then Tav, like that. So if, I, if you ever see any of the stuff I do with that symbol, it's just a, because you can say, well, what is the Aleph and Tav? Why is it not ever translated? It's actually the fourth word of the scripture, starting in Bereshit, which is Genesis, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But in Hebrew, it says, Bereshit, that's translated in the beginning, Bereshit bara, which is the word created, Elohim, et, Aleph Tav, et, it's not translated. Ha Shemayim, the heavens, va et, ha aret. But the, the word et is never translated. Well, there's two ways to do an et. So if you go Aleph Tav, ha Shemayim, It doesn't, ha is the letter for the, Shemayim is heavens, but this Aleph Tav is still not translated, but because it's hyphened, if you look at the printed text, what it means is it's pointing to the direct object. But there's this other Aleph Tav, which they call a standalone Aleph Tav, with no hyphen, and it's just there. It's the fourth letter in a seven, fourth word in a seven word sentence. Now, you have to look out and say, well, what's the proof of what it means? Nobody can prove what it means. The scribes, the rabbis, anybody who studies these things have no idea what it means, but you're allowed to conjecture. Of course, you can speculate what these things might mean. So part of the study is to discuss amongst yourselves what you might think it means. That's called midrashing, or midrashing. The word drash is the word which means to seek, and that with the prefix in the letter mem means the place of, or one who does this. Because the letter mem has to be placed, this is the place that the nun jumps out of. So see, once you know the names of the letters, you can plug them into the spelling of words and it'll give you a reference as to what's going on even if you're illiterate, which we'll get to in a little bit. The point is, a midrash, the word drash means to seek and explore and discuss and kind of look at, look at things. So a midrash is simply the place where you go for people to sit and talk about things. So if you have Bereshit bara Elohim et Hashemayim, it's never translated. There's no word that you can plug in there. No translation translates that word. And apparently I've heard that the rabbis don't even know why it's there. When I say the rabbis, I don't know rabbis, but it's like the sages, the great ones who have spent their life, generation after generation, studying these matters. So I'm invoking that phrase, the rabbis or the sages, with respect but I can't tell you who they are. But I can tell you this, when Yeshua appeared to John in the book of Revelation, he says, I'm the Aleph and the Tav. There are some who say, he's identifying himself as that one 
referred to by those two letters way back there in Genesis and also hundreds of places throughout the scriptures where nobody knows who he's referring to, but he's saying, I am the answer to that mystery. I am the Aleph and the Tav that nobody knows what this means. And you can say, well, but we kind of know what they mean. They're the first letter and the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And I would say alphabet instead of alphabet because alphabet is English and it comes from alpha and beta, which is Greek. But what what if you if you look at the um, if you look at the paleo aleph bet gimel galet a and you just flip that around in Greek they instead of going from right to left you go from left to right and you get aleph and then the, the bet uh, gimel turned into a c and the and the letter b. I can't remember that right English. It's backwards English. Anyway. It would be like that. Anyway, see, uh, D and E, E would be like that. So anyway, my point is what they did is they flipped it around. Not only reading, reading left to right, but you can see this is the inverse. If you were to connect that with the B and the C, and turn it into the and the Hebrew Yalbet is like that. It's almost like holding up a mirror. And so what I'm saying is, not only did they flip the culture, they flipped the writing, they flipped a lot of meanings. And you can say, well, how valid is the Greek? It's a useful tool if you want to scramble the meaning of something. If you want to hide something, put it in the mirror. You say, well, what, what happened? Well, that will go back into Daniel 12, 4, which we'll get to in a little bit. Oh, for a reason. Okay, anyway. Um, so the point is, if he says, I am the Aleph in the top, and you can say, well, it's more than just the first letter and the last letter of the alphabet. And you can say, well, how do we know what it means? Is it speculation? Is the scholars throwing it up for grabs? Is it just midrash to find it? What does the Almighty say about himself? Well, I, I was reading in Isaiah this one day, I believe it was Isaiah, he always talking about how he's going to tear apart Assyria, even though he called Assyria in to tear apart Israel for all their profanations, their profanity of what they did to his word. He, he gave Israel subject to Assyria who came in, but they went too far, so now Yahweh is going to whoop Assyria. And he says, as I have planned, concerning what he's going to do for them, as I have planned, so it shall be. As I have purposed, so shall it come about. And all of a sudden I realized, because I've been studying the meanings of the letters, that he's actually, a, that's the meaning of Aleph and Tav. Aleph is a plan 